From the earliest days of skateboarding video games, through the Tony Hawk years, the underground years, the skate years, the weird current era we're in now, and maybe the optimistic future we could have for future game titles like Skate 4, let's look at skateboarding games from over the years. Let's go all the way back to 1986. There was a classic skateboarding game in arcades known as 720 Degrees the ultimate aerial experience. It was a pretty primitive skateboarding game just released on these old arcade cabinets. It was actually published and developed by Atari for essentially what is the first skateboarding game. You could go up ramps and half pipes to score points. You could go downhill and have to navigate down the hill as fast as possible. There were obstacle courses where you had to pass between different flags. And then there was like this jump timing game. This thing was pretty wild. It was popular enough though where it would later see ports on the Commodore 64, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and even the game Boy Color. Just a couple of years later, in 1987, a game called Skate or Die released, which first came out on the Commodore 64. There were half pipe events, a freestyle ramp, and some downhill events. And while still pretty primitive, it also released on regular PCs and later on the Nintendo Entertainment System as well. But honestly, a name as rad as Skate or Die just kind of screams those late 80s, early 90s. Though I don't think there's ever like a threat to die in the game. I'm just saying. In 1994, or Activision published a game known as Radical Rex. He's my real cool Radical Rex. Radical Rex. Essentially, it was a dinosaur that could skateboard. The game was pretty average, I guess, but it had a fire-breathing dinosaur, so how mad could you get? And then by the late 90s, as video game skateboarding popularity was starting to rise, Thrasher themselves teamed up with Rockstar Games and developer Z-Access to create a realistic 3D skateboarding-like game in a game called Skate and Destroy. Okay, honestly, this game gets points just for having a name as metal as Thrasher's Skate and Destroy. It sounds like a Call of Duty game type. Now this game was actually praised quite a bit because it had more realistic controls. It was one of the first games to utilize ragdoll effects. And honestly, the game wasn't all that bad. However, it released at the same time as Tony Hawk. And Tony Hawk had a very easy entry level pick up and go arcade gameplay like experience. And this one was a little more realistic, making it take a little bit longer to master. And you'll see why Tony Hawk ended up just becoming so successful in the late 90s. 90s. But Rockstar weren't the only ones that realized that this market was growing, and Activision assigned the studio Neversoft to start working on a skateboard game to be ready by holiday of 1999. The team got to work picking out locations for the game and developing the core arcade mechanics, where players could control the rotation and the flip and grab tricks of the controlled character, and over time the level design was streamlined into less of a linear racetrack type level and more into an open skate environment. Environment. Though in the first game, you can still see some of the more linear type levels retain a lot of that in the later parts of the game. As the release of the game was coming closer, Activision wanted to find a pro skater to attach to the game to stir up even more PR for the game, and Tony Hawk was approached, and he was originally offered a straight up buyout deal where Activision would have use of his name for whatever they wanted to do, but instead Tony Hawk ended up negotiating a royalty payment system instead, meaning he made way more money from the Tony Hawk franchise over the years. The team at Neversoft also wanted to give players more of a reason to come back and replay the game, so a lot of extras were added into the game, like secret videotapes that players could find and discover, letters to collect, or objectives to complete while playing on a course with a limited amount of time. And while there still was the traditional high score and score objectives, these extra features went a long way in making this game just really enjoyable overall. Just a few months before the release of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, at the June 1999 X Games 5, Tony Hawk landed the 900, one of the most technically demanding tricks in all of competitive skateboarding, two and a half rotations, and it was a huge deal. And Tony Hawk's name and just public awareness of who Tony Hawk was would go way up after he was apparently the first skater to be able to pull this off especially at an event like the X Games. Also, just fun side note, in 2011 and 2016, Tony Hawk pulled off the 900s again, just showing off he could still do it. I think that's pretty cool. Nonetheless, in September 29 of 1999, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater would officially release
release and would later be brought on to systems like the Nintendo 64. And man, was this game incredible. If you played this game back in the day, you know immediately that the first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game and the song Superman by Goldfinger just go hand in hand. Now, of course, the first level was Warehouse, and this map would become iconic, showing up in a ton of Tony Hawk games over the years. It was just like this perfect mix of downhill, vert, and street gameplay in a small arena, and it was the first map you played, so a lot of people have been familiar with it, and that's probably why it gets brought back so often. But the first game had some other banger levels as well. There was the school, there was this mall that had this awesome set piece, just skating through a mall I always thought looked really cool. There was this level downtown, which as a kid I thought was New York. It was not. And then I also didn't have a memory card when I was little, so we would just try to get as far along in the game as we could without saving. And sometimes if we had a really good afternoon, we could make it as far as downhill jam, which was also a pretty cool level. Tony Hawk Pro Skater became a huge success, and just one year later, a follow-up game, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, would be set to release. This game essentially was an enhanced version of the original game, but with more things like customizable characters, brand new locations, more celebrity guest skaters, and then a map designer, which would become a staple across not just Tony Hawk, but the entire skateboarding genre. Like, that was a big selling point of other skateboarding games like the Skate series down the road as well. And of course, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 had some great locations as well, like it had this hangar, it had School 2, which was like the first school, but different. This time around, they actually had a map in New York, and you know what? I don't remember ever playing this one. This map called Venice is this interesting location in California known as The Pit that was actually torn down right before this game came out, and was later replaced with a little skateboarding park. But it was kind of interesting how they were able to preserve this popular skateboarding location in the real world with a video game. Also, there's a magic homeless man on this level. Now, the coolest part about the first two Tony Hawk games were back in the day, if you did make it far enough into the game to the end, you would also unlock some pretty cool levels. Like in Tony Hawk 1, you had Roswell, New Mexico, which was like for aliens or whatnot. And in Pro Skater 2, you get to go to space. That was so cool. And the success for Activision and Neversoft with the Tony Hawk games definitely wouldn't stop here. Right after the release of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 went into development and also an enhanced version of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 called Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X, which was developed by Treyarch. It was just an enhanced version of the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, but with some new maps and enhanced graphics specifically for the newly launched Xbox. Tony Hawk Hawk 3 had some really cool levels as well. There was Foundry, you know, your typical warehouse type level. Then you went to Canada, which looked pretty Canadian. Rio de Janeiro and Suburbia. There was this really cool airport level, but this game being set to release in October of 2001 originally had an objective where players had to go defuse a bomb off of an airplane, and this quickly got changed prior to release to stopping pickpocketers. And there were some other cool locations too, like this cruise ship. Oh, and Warehouse alongside of a few other iconic maps from back the day came back as well. At this point, people were loving Tony Hawk, so it only made sense. This is a yearly franchise now. Activision was like, let's do it again. And then Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 would enter development, and this was the only Tony Hawk game to ever be made for the Tapwave Zodiac. Yeah. This was the first game to introduce a career mode, which later would be turned into story modes of later Tony Hawk games. And what's interesting is the Tony Hawk franchise would pivot a bit after Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4, but it seemed like Activision and Neversoft really just hit the nail on the head with Tony Hawk gameplay and features that they had the groundwork down perfectly to go and expand on a lot of the ideas that made Tony Hawk so successful. I mean, Tony Hawk 4 had some cool locations in this one too. Like there was a college with a big area to it. You go to San Francisco. There was Alcatraz, like the prison island as a level. I mean, this is like Mob of the Dead all over again. Actually, this was a great idea for a map in a Tony Hawk game. There was this level called Kona State Park that takes you to one of the most terrifying places in the world, Florida, we get to go to London, and then we get to go to a zoo in London, and this weird carnival, which I think might be in Texas. Now, depending on which game system you had, you might have had some levels omitted, and maybe even had extra levels that weren't in the newer gen versions of the game. Like, if you're still playing on a PlayStation 1 at this point, you had this one level that made us feel really, really small, and I just think that that one's kind of interesting. Now, after the release of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4, Activision would want to push the boundaries as what Tony Hawk Pro Skater games could do and look like, and they would make some pretty big changes to the Tony Hawk formula moving forward that were kind of interesting. But before we jump right into that, during the four years where Tony Hawk games were 
just blowing up. There were some other skateboarding games popping up here and there that we should talk about as well. Now, of course, all of the Tony Hawk games that released also had like Game Boy counterparts for every single release. And surprisingly enough, these Game Boy games weren't actually the worst things in the world. They were surprisingly competent, actually kind of fun. I remember trying to write down the code for what one of the levels was on the cartridge itself so I wouldn't ever forget. It was just the way you did things back then. Yeah, I don't know if they really hold up as well nowadays, but I do think that back in the day, this was like peak handheld gaming. Okay, but what else released in the late 90s, early 2000s years? Like for instance, if you were a kid back in the day and you had parents who didn't know what they were doing, you might have asked for Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and ended up getting Grind Session for the PlayStation 1 instead. I mean, this game was competent enough. It was a skateboarding game, very much heavily inspired by Tony Hawk and tried to release in a time in between Tony Hawk releases. Uh, but no, it wasn't as good as the main Tony Hawk games. It was just kind of there and existed. There was MTV Sports Skateboarding featuring Andy McDonald. This one saw releases on Game Boy, Windows, PlayStation, and Dreamcast. Obviously, they were trying to capitalize on the Tony Hawk games also. They even had a Goldfinger song in their soundtrack. Uh, the gameplay wasn't that good other than the surprisingly awesome soundtrack, but yeah, for a skateboarding game, it was kind of meh. Maybe even more clunky than we remembered. EA tried to publish an interesting game called Street Skater, and this was just at the rise of popularity in skateboarding games overall, not necessarily a game that competed directly against Tony Hawk. It was just a different approach to the skateboarding genre, and at least they did something unique. I just don't think that this game scored well enough. It was kind of just middle of the road reviewed. And of course, Tony Hawk would outshine it when it would release. If we're talking about the games that released right before Tony Hawk. There were the games like 2 Extreme and 3 Extreme, and there's a reason nobody talks about these games nowadays. I mean, I guess these weren't full skateboarding games, but they had skateboarding elements or skateboarding sections to the game. You could also ride a bike or roller skates. If you had a GameCube or a PS2, there was Evolution Skateboarding. And if you got this instead of like Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 or 4, I I I'm sorry, I guess. This game was literally and generally unfavorable when it came to its reviews. Heck, even Disney threw their hat in the ring doing a Disney's extremely goofy skateboarding game. Honestly, I can't hate this one. This is such an interesting idea. There was like a limited time release with Kellogg cereal boxes where you could get a demo of the game on a CD-ROM. I remember seeing people talk about this or maybe commercials for it. I never actually played it myself, but I think I mean, it was okay enough that some people have fond memories about it. It's actually really interesting to see how many game publishers just wanted a skateboarding game after how successful Tony Hawk was and were willing to just like throw anything at the wall to see if it would stick. And a lot of the times they were just kind of mediocre. ESPN X Games Skateboarding, published by Konami, of course. A whole lot of sixes and sevens out of tens. Oh, and a couple of fours. Okay, Go Go Hyperground is a really interesting game. This one had a really unique approach to it. It was like a cartoon, comedic, story-focused skateboarding game. The skateboarding gameplay was pretty mediocre, but at least it was something different from what everything else had been. Okay, so I know this next one doesn't count as a skateboarding game, but when else am I gonna have the opportunity to talk about Razor Freestyle Scooter? Yeah, it was a scooter game very heavily inspired by the Tony Hawk games and the popularity that was with those, except instead of skateboarding, you have a Razor Scooter. Look at this, this is incredible. Now here, let me sweeten the pot a little bit about this game. This was a Blockbuster exclusive game. So you could only rent or buy it at Blockbuster video rental stores. And honestly, I unfortunately only ever got to play this game like one time as a kid. I don't even remember where I was. I just vaguely remember playing this game somewhere that wasn't my house. But coming back and getting to play this game nowadays? Oh, wow. Look at this. You get to choose between a couple of different pictures of Razor scooters. It's just the color. But look at this. These scooters are special scooters because those handles are definitely way better than any of those non-waterproof handles we had as kids. You drop your Razor scooter in a puddle or leave it outside at night, it's like holding a cold, wet sponge the next day. And then they like rip and they tear and they start to come off. I'm getting distracted. Back on topic. Honestly, this game's interesting. It definitely doesn't play well like the Tony Hawk games. It feels much much slower. I don't know if it's because of the fact it's a scooter, but the tricks definitely feel a little less cooler, and our characters just seem so massive for the scooters. I don't know, there's just something weird about doing a one-hander. It's like, was that actually a cool trick? Really? I don't know. This game was interesting, though. The soundtrack was kind of a banger, at least on the PlayStation and Dreamcast versions. I don't know, the N64 versions don't have, like, lyrics or anything? I don't understand what's going on here. Also, there's this one level that takes place, like, way up in the sky. Like, what are we even on here? 
here. Is this the flying aircraft carrier from Avengers? Like, what? I think this game had its own charm. I think there's some cool nostalgia for this, but they definitely didn't ever make another scooter game again, so. But wait, there was a Game Boy Color release of this game and a GBA one too. Okay, hear me out. Surprisingly enough, these handheld games weren't really the worst things ever. I mean, especially the Game Boy Color, there were a lot of not very good games that were just quick cash grabs thrown out there. So to get a game like this that isn't the worst thing and kind of fun for a little while, eh, why not give it a win? I mean, the Tony Hawk games on Game Boy also sufficed, so why shouldn't this? I'm just surprised that this one turned out to be so much better than the actual main version. Okay, then there was The Simpsons Skateboarding, and personally, I never actually played this one, but Luke had played it quite a bit, so it's always interesting to hear his perspective, especially when he didn't have as much of a history in those earlier Tony Hawk games. What was this game like from a more casual player just trying to figure out what's going on? Well, actually, after playing this game a little bit again for this video, I do have to say this game is actually kind of fire. Honestly, I'm pretty bad at these skateboard games, but I kind of had fun playing this one. It definitely is not as fluid as the Tony Hawk games. Don't get me wrong. This still is clunky when it comes to the gameplay side, but there was so much content in this game and it was just a straight one-to-one -one knockoff of Tony Hawk. You had to letter collect, you the item collect all that stuff there was so many maps with iconic locations from the simpsons there was a couple different characters from the simpsons you could play as which was cool and personally i think overall this is probably as good as a tony hawk knockoff could get like legit the gameplay is so par it's bearable you can you can deal with it while they didn't manage to rip off the gameplay for whatever reason at least they ripped off all the things you could do in the game and i think it's pretty cool actually this even got its own mall map i don't know this game got a certain charm to it. I kind of like it. But everything would change when it was time for Tony Hawk's Underground to release. There were two of these games, Tony Hawk's Underground and Tony Hawk's Underground 2, and man, were both of these games bangers. Okay, so first of all, it took the core aspects that were awesome with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 and then just like built upon them. These games were way more narrative-based, where you got to make your own skater and customize the way that they looked, and then you progress through a narrative experience, and then one of the biggest things introduced here were the facts that you could walk around and just get off your board and go walk. I know it sounds like a really tricky trivial thing, but this actually was huge. Before the Tony Hawk games were so focused on that arcade gameplay that sometimes if you're trying to get to a specific location to try a trick or something, it could be a pain. Walking just added so much more to what you're able to do and how you wanted to approach things, set things up. You didn't have to just do it in the exact moment. This game had like the regular quests, but then also side quests. Oddly enough, this game stepped away from the traditional Tony Hawk format and made more of like an adventure game that still focused on the core skateboarding gameplay that was really well loved. Over gameplay, you could level up your stats, much like something you'd see out of an RPG. And at this point, even Tony Hawk's Underground 2 did a couple of interesting callbacks to older Tony Hawk games, bringing locations that were popular in the first couple of games to the forefront here, which was awesome. And while most people can usually agree that the story in the first Underground game was probably better than the second one, where the second one kind of just took things to a whole nother level, man oh man, active Vision should bring the Underground series back, I think players would really like it. Oh, and there was also a PSP version of Tony Hawk's Underground 2 called Remix. Sounds like a Mountain Dew flavor. I do have to say with how much praise we're giving these Underground games, the comedy in the cutscenes and story maybe doesn't hold up as well today. Uh, you ever think the last word you're gonna hear would be? Butt nuggets? Fire in the hole! <laughs> wow, that sucks. Brutal road trip. Gas station burritos plus a van crammed with dudes. Nothing like a 90 mile an hour Dutch oven. Now, something we haven't talked about too much in this video was the multiplayer side of Tony Hawk games, which honestly, as far as multiplayer split screen titles go, the Tony Hawk games were kind of a go-to series to go and have some fun, do graffiti mode, or just try to go for the higher scores. Some of the later games would have online functionality, but it was when Tony Hawk's American Wasteland released that it would be the first game in the series to support Xbox Live. This game also had the whole big open world aspect of the game, or I guess you'd say 
say it's like one continuous level. And this time around you can ride bicycles? Hey, that's kind of cool, I guess. I must have missed out on the hype of American Wasteland. Maybe I was burnt out at the time from Underground 2 and just playing a new Tony Hawk game every year for many years. But fortunately, Luke did play this one. One of the few Tony Hawk games he did go after and I think he had positive memories about it, uh, Luke? And yeah, let's just write, I used to love this game. You gotta imagine this, I was growing up in Europe, I've never been to the US, but I would always see like these cool locations in television shows and in movies. And then here's this game where I get to explore Los Angeles, Hollywood, Beverly Hills, all these locations I know from movies and TV shows, and I just get to skate around them and that was the coolest thing to me. Now, I don't know, it is an open world game, kind of. You go like through tunnels and stuff, I think, to get between different areas. So it isn't really an open world game. And as Elijah already said, this was one of the only Tony Hawk games I ever played. So I can't really judge if the gameplay, you know, was better or worse than the previous games. But looking at the other titles while I was editing this, it just seems pretty much the same. Just with what to me seemed like cooler locations than the previous games had. But to be honest, there have been pretty cool locations in the Tony Hawk franchise, including American Wastelands. And I do think like some old maps like the mall came back and they're pretty sick as well. So obviously I can't accredit that to American Wasteland if they're old maps that are cool. Oh, also this did have a level in Kyoto in Japan, which also was pretty sick. So overall, this is still my favorite Tony Hawk game and it probably forever will be just cause I'm nostalgic for it. And I mean, you can say that's bad, but uh, hey. It is what it is. Oh, and also before I forget, the soundtrack also was a banger. You had like Green Day, you had Public Enemy, you had Fall Out Boy and all these songs. But I can see how the soundtrack was maybe a little different from the previous Tony Hawk games and maybe that threw off some people, but I thought it was great. Okay, you know what? Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam does not get enough love. It was one of the earlier Wii titles and I think a lot of people just overlooked it when this game released, but for a spin-off game in the Tony Hawk genre, it was actually really cool. It was like a racing game where you're obviously Obviously on a skateboard, but just the world building, the locations you go to, and the gameplay were relatively addicting, even if you had to use the Wiimote or whatever. I thoroughly enjoyed this one, playing it back in the day. There was like voice acting in it, which was interesting because the characters were so over the top, so sometimes there's like some weird storyline going on and you're like, what am I even playing? And you tie that together with this weird gameplay, and you are on like a fever dream Tony Hawk skateboarding ride, and it's kind of awesome. Also, just saying, not that I I need to say this for every Tony Hawk game because Tony Hawk just nails the soundtrack usually, but this game's soundtrack also alongside most Tony Hawk games was pretty great as well. Seriously, don't sleep on Downhill Jam. It's a little weird, but kind of awesome. After that, we had Tony Hawk's Project 8, which I guess is to say that all those unnumbered Tony Hawk games were still main entries in the series. I guess that makes sense. Now this game's interesting because depending on what generation of console you had, this game would run on different engines. So for instance, if you had the original Xbox or the PlayStation 2, you were running on the same engine that Tony Hawk's American Wasteland ran on. But if you were playing on the next generation of consoles, like the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3, you had a brand new engine built for Tony Hawk. Now this game was the first real open world Tony Hawk game, this time there weren't tunnels connecting the areas together, and there were some other really big improvements made to the Tony Hawk game here. Like for instance, a lot of the characters are motion captured, so there's not recycled animations for the skaters. They even added a whole bail mechanic where you could try to injure yourself on purpose and rack up a high medical bill. And you know what, this game was met with mostly positive reviews across the board, there were some critics criticisms about things like the frame rate and lack of online on the PlayStation versions of the game, but the graphical enhancements tied together with some of the new features added in made this one a solid Tony Hawk title, even if Tony Hawk fatigue was starting to set in. And then just a year later, we'd have another Tony Hawk game in Tony Hawk's Proving Ground, which I guess is Tony Hawk 9. This game was a lot like the previous Tony Hawk game, except was kind of more of a return to the classic arcade type gameplay that was popular back in the day. It retained a lot of the features from the newer games over the years, which was good, and the story mode had different types of goals that you could go after. Multiplayer was finally added to PlayStation, but I think this game was ultimately criticized for not changing enough from the previous title, along with the fact that this was still releasing on the previous generation of consoles with way more watered down versions of the games. So the reception was kind of all over the place. Some outlets loved it, 
others were a little more harsh on it. Nonetheless though, it was pretty clear that Tony Hawk being a yearly release was starting to get really tiring for the fan base, and I think the sales started to reflect that. Okay, so the late 2000s were a really weird time. I mean, Tony Hawk fatigue had already set in a bit, that's probably why Skate was so successful, but where you think Tony Hawk would have tried to innovate or make a really polished up experience to compete with Skate, they pivoted in a weird direction. They decided to go for a skateboard peripheral to simulate real skateboarding. Yeah, Tony Hawk Ride was released in 2009, and when you paid $120, you got the game and this little uh, skateboard paddle that you can stand on. Okay, I guess in the late 2000s, peripherals in games were kind of this commonplace thing. I mean, Guitar Hero had the guitars, Rock Band was huge, Nintendo had been crushing it with motion controls, and they even had the little tennis rackets that you could attach to your controller that didn't do anything, or those little steering wheels. So sure, why not? Why doesn't Tony Hawk try to throw their hat in the ring too? I think the biggest issue with this game was the fact that the controls were really bad. Like, the skateboard controller didn't seem to be responsive a lot of the time, and there was so much confusion as to how to get the game to even function properly to a small extent, let alone parts of the game where you're supposed to do challenging tricks. It was so confusing after its release that even the developer posted like homemade videos onto their YouTube channel of tutorials of how to play the game, and some of the time it seems like the things that they were going for weren't even working for themselves. What's really unique here is that this was supposed to be the turning point for the Tony Hawk franchise. Activision had even publicly said that they were looking for a way to re-engineer the Tony Hawk franchise, and the company was looking to deliver a breakthrough that the franchise needed. Yeah, yeah, uh, this wasn't it. There was just so much frustration with trying to play the game that unless you were really committed into learning the nuanced parts of how this game functioned, the game was practically unplayable. You'd have to put a lot of time into figuring this thing out just to try to enjoy it. Still, the game sold 114,000 units and at $120 per set, that's decent money. So Activision greenlit another game for the following year in Tony Hawk's Shred. The first week in the US of this follow-up game, it sold 3,000 copies. That shows not only how badly the Tony Hawk fanbase was burnt, but also how badly the player base that bought the first game must have felt burnt if such a small portion were willing to try this game to see if it worked again after the experience of the previous title. There were a few new features in this game, like a snowboarding mode. You could use your Xbox avatar or Wii character as well. I'll be honest, I've never given Tony Hawk Shred a try, but if any of you actually owned it or played it, maybe let us know in the comments because I'm just curious what on earth this experience was really like. The box says there's big air and bigger tricks, so okay. I think this caused the Tony Hawk franchise to be set up or mostly ready for a hiatus, and Neversoft and Activision decided to pump the brakes with the series at this point for at least a couple of years. It wouldn't be until 2012 when we would see something new on the horizon. And by new, we mean an HD remaster? That's not even a remaster. And with the eras changing, the rise of one of the greatest skateboarding game series besides Tony Hawk would begin. Yeah, we're talking about Skate. Skate was such a breath of fresh air in 2007. Just from the title alone, it was basic, bare bones, this is what the game is about, and it's skateboarding. This game completely reinvented skateboarding games on console, this time emphasizing the analog stick to read what type of tricks players were doing with a flick of a thumb. This time going for a more realistic approach, tying elements of stylized film reels and an incredibly high skill ceiling, EA's Black Box was really cooking something here. This game stood out against the Tony Hawk series because for the first time ever, it felt like a fresh take on a common genre, but this time something very modern and felt like at the time a next gen game. The game had a big open world you could explore, and the whole purpose of the game was to go and own spots and essentially trying to get the coolest skate reels or photos possible. Actually, the more you think about it, technically the camera perspective is done from the idea that you are seeing things from the cameraman's perspective. Would that mean that this game 
technically falls into the second person perspective. I mean, obviously, in a more traditional sense, it's third person, but you get what I'm saying. Our camera guy is an actual character. This game also introduced Hall of Meat, which was a separate game type than the typical skateboarding game types that are out there, like High Scores or Skate Pig Horse, whatever you want to call that game type. Hall of Meat was all about doing the opposite, injuring yourself in the best way possible. It was pretty awesome. You would have to try to, like, wipe out really badly, and then it would tell you your score, and it was built into the main game mechanic, but this would become like a multiplayer mode that was really fun also, and really extreme by the end of the trilogy. Here's the deal, Skate was good, but Skate 2 was amazing. Skate 2 essentially took all the working elements and pieces that Skate 1 had done well and just evolved the entire franchise. There were new tricks added into the game for the first time ever you could actually get off of your skateboard. And man, were the grab tricks in Skate 2 just really, really good. Skate 2 gave you complete freedom to flip however much you wanted, even if it meant you probably weren't going to make it or land. It just added this risk-reward function into the game that was really awesome. I played a ton of multiplayer with Skate 2, and there was a strong Skate 2 community through and through its life on the Xbox 360 days, or PS3 if you're that kid. If you were a player back in the day, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're talking Skate 2 Fun Track. Ugh, this area is so great, especially in multiplayer spot battles. The amount of combos that you can do here to get your score to chain across is incredible. But there's other great locations too, like the stadium was a lot of fun. There is Danny's Mega Ramp. And of course, you would always play one-on-one -on -one skate on library stairs. It was just like a rule of Skate 2. And then of course, everyone got really good at doing this little leg hop bean plant thing down the side of the stairs, and that could add to your overall rotation. So of course, then everyone got really good at exploiting this trick, and then the competition became way more complex after a while. And then of course, in Hall of Meat, there were a couple of great locations, but Dam was a really great one, and there was a no comply glitch that a lot of us did that would let you fly up in the air and add some extra points. There's a couple other tricks that people would also do to launch their character, just exploiting the kind of wonky physics of Skate 2. But man, I would almost argue Skate 2 was better than Skate 3, but Skate 3 was also really good, and it had a lot of different things that Skate 2 didn't have, so they're equal, but both Skate 2 and Skate 3 still feel like very different games. Now when Skate 3 rolled around, the hype was real. I think by this point, people finally understood why Skate was special, and I think EA Black Box just kind of let loose and just really opened up the gates to everything and anything. The locations in Skate 3 were awesome. They updated the visuals quite a bit, kind of stepping away from more of that grainy feeling from the first two Skate games. It was a breath of fresh air at the time for the color palette. And just across the board with all of the locations and the different game types, for a game where you think you would just be skating around, they really thought through the world pretty well in how experiences would come together and what a player might do when playing the game. It just felt like everything had a whole lot more polish put into this game while still keeping kind of some of the random hilarious things intact. Hall of Meat was refined even more where you could have even bigger, crazier bales than ever before. I think they realized that this game mode was popular, so they brought it more to the forefront than ever before. And I think they also did that with some of the other locations that were in Skate 3. Skate 3 has a long list of iconic skating areas for sure, but of course the Mega Park in Skate 3 was like the go-to location to do everything and anything. Another interesting thing is that years after the game's initial release, it had to be produced again, because the game rose in popularity due to YouTube giving the game publicity with the rise of Let's Play YouTubers a couple of years after Skate 3 had come out. And it's a real shame that Black Box ended up getting shut down because they could have continued the Skate series and supported it for a long time and I think a lot of people would have come back to it. Skate's one of those games that I can just sit down and mindlessly play while talking to friends or listening to a podcast and not get bored at whatever's going on on my screen. Honestly, the physics and the mechanics just tied together just make everything feel so satisfying to pull off a trick, and if you're just standing there flicking your analog stick to try to master some of the more complex tricks, it just feels so good when you finally have it click in your brain, why sometimes you can get a laser flip off and other times you're stuck pop shoveting. The skate games were amazing. It was so cool that you could just tell if someone was good or not, if they were Mongo pushing or not. That you could look at someone for three seconds and tell if they knew what they were doing or were just completely lost. 
Man, Skate 3 really lived a long, long time longer than anyone probably expected originally when this game released. And it still has a little bit of a player base nowadays because up until now, it's probably one of the best skating games on console. A couple of years back, EA officially announced that Skate would be rebooted with an all new team being put together to develop this game. And while it is EA, we are cautiously optimistic that this game will be a solid experience. They've shown off a couple of things from play tests, and it really looks like they're trying to nail that same gameplay perfectly before digging in and working on things like visuals or cosmetics or stuff like that. Apparently the game is supposed to be free to play and will likely be supported through cosmetic microtransactions, but if they can just nail the gameplay down and give players enough to do, it could be a hit. Like we said, cautiously optimistic with this one. If they really take the skate idea, run with it, and let it evolve, then there's hope here. Oh yeah, we can't forget, there was another skate game though called Skate It. It came out between one and two. These were watered down versions of Skate 1 for the Nintendo DS and the Nintendo Wii. Also, the DS version would be ported to iOS later on. Since the Wii and the DS didn't have analog sticks, at least required in the Wii sense, they used other forms for gameplay, like motion control for the Wii or the touchscreen for the DS. You could plug a nunchuck in on your Wii version of the game, but it wouldn't give you the flick skateboarding controls. Heck, you could even use your Wii balance board if you wanted to. That's an option. Interestingly enough, the reviews for these games were kind of all over the place, actually. I don't know, some review outlets gave it a 4 out of 10, and others gave it an 8.5 out of 10. I'll be honest, I've never played Skate on a Nintendo console before, but looking at this gameplay and just talking about the things that made Skate feel special to me, I feel like not having the flick stick is like the most important part of the game, and just the way that it feels, so... I don't think this game would be really good. It'd be like taking Halo and saying, okay, now go play the game without shooting. Just kind of a dumb idea. You know what also is kind of a dumb idea? Releasing a shallow SpongeBob skateboarding game in 2011. Well, in 2011, THQ released SpongeBob Surf and Skate Road Trip for the Xbox 360 and the Nintendo DS. And if you played it on the Xbox, it was a Kinect game. So, you know, those were always great. You sit in front of the Kinect and you just jump up and down as if you're on a real skateboard. It was goofy as heck. And if you played it on Nintendo DS, you had more traditional controls but obviously it was the DS version of the game and I mean you'd use the touchscreen for some stuff but generally this felt like a game for babies like straight up like toddlers I don't know how you could get any enjoyment out of playing this for more than five minutes if you're an adult or even a developing teenager when it came to gameplay you would just go straight down the hill and sometimes move left to right there really wasn't much to it sometimes you were on a skateboard and sometimes you were on a surfboard which I guess that's like a skateboard on water I don't know I remember thinking this back in the day but the cutscenes they were like a powerpoint presentation it was like the weirdest thing and i mean i think this was just a spongebob cash grab i mean there have been a couple of those over the years so that's all i really have to say about it it was just really boring and that's worse than a bad game if you ask me tony hawk pro skater hd was kind of an interesting game originally i thought this game was a remake of the original tony hawk game when i bought it on the xbox live arcade but remake's not really the perfect word for it if anything it's more its own experience and it plays a lot like the traditional Tony Hawk games, the arcade style, but instead of truly remaking all of the original maps, it just picked a handful of popular maps from the first couple of games. I had quite a bit of fun with this one. I don't think people mark this as like the best Tony Hawk game ever, but it was a fun little arcade game and it wasn't like a full price $60 back then, so I couldn't complain. But the hiatus continued. It wouldn't be until 2015 when the series would finally come back, probably in a worse state than ever. Now we already talked about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, which released in 2015 in our video on games that killed game franchises. But yeah, this game was very, very rushed. It had an eight gigabyte day one patch. The gameplay itself didn't look that good in the initial trailer showing off the game. So later a cell shaded art style was applied to maybe mask the gameplay. The game was rushed all because of a deal with Tony Hawk and the likeness being set to expire that Activision just wanted to pump this thing out as quickly as possible. I always found it kind of interesting though that they opted for going for the title of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5 when very clearly Tony Hawk Project 8 was signifying that it was the 8th game and there was a ninth game after that. So this would have likely, if we skipped the spinoffs, just been Tony Hawk 10. Instead, they went all the way back to Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5. 
I mean, I guess they were trying to market it as a return to form for the series, but all they really had to do was market this game to their hardcore fan base of the older games, and that hardcore fan base definitely knew that Project 8 was a reference to it being the eighth Tony Hawk game, I guess. So the five was misleading on both fronts of the hardcore fans and the casual audience, and then the game was bad. It didn't even live up to the expectations set from Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 in 2002. But man, oh man, was this such a disappointing title, and it was kind of just the last new Tony Hawk experience for a long time and the last taste that anyone would have of the series until at least 2020. And you know what? Tony Hawk ended on a really bad note with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5, and then all of a sudden the script would be flipped when we got something really, really good actually. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, developed by Vicarious Visions, who back in the day did the handheld versions of the Tony Hawk games, so at least they were a part of the original yearly developments of Tony Hawk games. And Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 was a full, from the ground up, remake of the original two games. Honestly, I was incredibly impressed with this game. It was a true to form Tony Hawk game built in the Unreal Engine, and it played pretty much just as well as the old Tony Hawk games did, but a lot of those rougher edges from back in the day were smoothed out gameplay wise. All of the locations from the first two games were beautifully remade, and actually this release reminded me why those first Tony Hawk games back in the day were so much fun. Having those goals to go after and you have to complete them in just a two minute time period adds this exciting challenge that's really satisfying when you do achieve it, and you can tell there was a lot of detail put into this remake. They took a lot of the new tricks that were introduced in much later games and included them in this remake. They added a ton of professional skateboarders that have appeared in all of the Tony Hawk games over the years, including some new ones. The soundtrack was incredible again, pulling some of the best songs from Tony Hawk's 1 and 2. And this game released and was met with pretty much universal acclaim. It was a solid way to re-experience the classics, and it actually was the final game that Vicarious Visions would work on before being merged into Blizzard Entertainment. Unfortunately, there were plans to do a Tony Hawk 3 and 4 remake as as well, since all the groundwork was right there, and Activision apparently tried to find another studio to work on this project, but it seemed like to Activision there wasn't any other studio that was talented enough and familiar enough with the DNA of Tony Hawk to take on the remake for 3 and 4 without Vicarious Visions being available to work on it. I'm still really disappointed that we didn't actually get that to release, because I feel like if they have the game running this well in Tony Hawk 1 and 2, 3 and 4 would have just been easy to do. Man, Vicarious Visions has had it tough over the years with cancelled games. They had their Call of Duty Roman Wars cancelled, they had Guitar Hero 7 cancelled, they had a Crash Bandicoot and a Skylander game cancelled, and now Tony Hawk 3 and 4. But honestly, that's where we're at now. There's still a lot of fans who would love to see this remake come to light for 3 and 4, but at the very least, if we're going to enter another era of hiatus for the Tony Hawk side of things, the games ended on a high note, unless we count, you know, these like little mobile cash grabs that have come out periodically. And I mean, that's at least better than Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5 being the last taste fans would get for the series. After all of this, the future years of the skateboarding genre really wouldn't be all that impressive. Matter of fact, there's only been a handful of skateboarding related things that are out there. A new studio known as Creature Studios entered the fold and began working on a project known as Session. And honestly, everything that they showed off in the early days to them setting up a Kickstarter for their game looked really, really promising. Actually, it felt like it was heavily inspired by Skate, and it had been years since a Skate game had released, so this had potential to be a spiritual successor. The only problem here, really, with Session, the gameplay was just a little bit too different, and then there wasn't a whole lot to actually do in the game. Yes, it does feel like a satisfying skateboarding game, but then what? Where do you go with it? Skate was so successful because of all of the things you could do, and this being strictly single player and, and way more street inclined with not a whole lot of vert, it does exactly what the title says it is. It is a skate sim, and um, it maybe reminds us more as to why some of the most realistic parts of skateboarding are a lot of the times omitted into the good skateboarding games that were super popular. I don't know if I want to play a game that is almost as hard to do a kickflip in as it would be for me to just buy a skateboard and learn how to do a real kickflip. Skater XL is another game that kind of falls into a similar trap here. Like there are so many people who want a good follow-up game to skate and Skater XL looks like everything a skate fan could like. But when you actually 
actually sit down and start playing it, you probably notice that a lot of the controls are different. They're not the hardest thing to pick up, and it seems like one foot is controlled by one stick and the other foot is controlled by the other stick. So yeah, they're trying to innovate and make their skateboarding game stand out, but it more in this case feels like they're trying to reinvent the wheel than doing something innovative that makes the gameplay as a whole feel like a step in the newer, more modern direction rather than changing things just to stand out. Skate was so successful because they nailed this new precision system with the analog stick flicking. And maybe they were trying to do the same thing here where you control the board with your feet, but it feels more limiting than intuitive. We've seen in this video so many skateboarding games that just kind of flopped out there in the skateboarding genre, and a lot of the time they're just mediocre, but if a new skateboarding game like this new skate reboot that EA is working on, or Skate 4, however you want to call it, is going to be successful, it's going to have to do things like take the great control scheme from the Skate Trilogy and apply that to a new game world that's very much so built from the ground up with the skateboarding mechanics in mind. And then after doing all that, they're also still going to have to build out the world so there's a lot of engaging things to do in the world. I think it's like some of the gameplay factors were fleshed out for things like Sessions or Skater XL, but once they had the base game working, it seemed like the game went straight to release rather than then building a game where there's a lot to do and things to experience based on the locations and the world that has been built for the game. Also, we didn't touch on this one earlier on, but back during the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era, there was a Sean White skateboarding game. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting concept considering Sean White is known for his snowboarding and he had multiple snowboarding games. For whatever reason, they're like, hey, put him on a skateboard. Why not? And then we got Sean White's skateboarding. Now, this game's interesting, though, because because it seems like, for the most part, reception's all over the place. People, initially, when this game released, didn't seem to care for it, but then, over time, it seems like there is a sentiment from a community that really did enjoy the game. Fan response is kind of all over the place, but it seemed like some people did really enjoy this game. I never got to play it, so I don't know if it's a great game, but it exists. Sean White has a skateboarding game, and I still think that that's goofy. It's just so funny, because obviously the Sean White snowboarding games, like, they picked to make a game based around Sean White because of his success in the Olympics and all that, the same way that Tony Hawk was picked to represent a skateboarding game series because of his success in the X Games, right? And then they're like, uh, pff, just give him a board and some wheels, and uh, she knows how to skateboard, why not? It's just like, really interesting that it's like, we can't get Tony Hawk, so let's just pick the snowboarder. It is a Ubisoft game. So. And then they would go on and make Riders Republic. So I think Riders Republic is an interesting game. At first, I totally didn't think that this one should be included in this video, but now after looking at this game more closely, it totally does with the new like skateboarding stuff that they added in. Yeah, actually, uh, the skateboarding add-on just released, I think, at the end of September for $25, which, you know, uh, that's kind of a heavy <laughs> price. But allegedly, the skateboarding gameplay is good, so... They're sad, but from what I can tell, the content that you actually do when you skate isn't there yet. So, uh, I don't know if it's worth it. It's like challenge based and people say you can do all the challenges in like four to five hours. So from what I can tell, it's like $25 to skate around for four to five hours. I don't know if that's worth it. I haven't tried Riders Republic yet, but I always wonder if it's actually ever worth the price tag it's always listed as. It's kind of a pricier game. I don't know though, maybe it is really good. I mean, there's always chance that they add more maps for the skate DLC, so maybe it's it'll be worth it in the future, but I'd say right now it's probably a little overpriced. But you know those Ubisoft games, they do always go on sale eventually for like a price where you're like, hmm, maybe, maybe it's worth it. Uh, there's also the Ollie Ollie games. I don't know if you've heard of these or Ollie Ollie World. I've vaguely heard of them. It's a little bit more of like an indie game. Uh, they're, they're pretty cool. They're very like artistic in a lot of the like coloration and the animation. It's very different from a lot of the skateboarding games we've talked about today so far. The game's more of like a side scrolling approach and it's not really reminiscent of like a Tony Hawk game or a skate game. It's just a, its own thing, but it's really kind of craftfully done. They usually are, I haven't, I haven't spent too much time with these games, but from what I have played, they are kind of fun and um, yeah, not a bad experience. Not necessarily like a core skateboarding experience, but it's still a really cool stylized one. And as they make new titles with uh, the newer one is a lot more like of a step up from the previous game. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And by the way, the animation that goes with the game is 
really cool too. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's something else for sure. So you know how we touched on the Tony Hawk Game Boy games earlier? Yeah. There was actually four Nintendo DS games that came out as well. Wait, four? There was four, yeah. How are they? It's it started off with uh, Tony Hawk's American Skateland, which was a cell shaded version of American Wasteland, which looks really weird. It had like these cartoon cutscenes. It was called American Skateland. Did it have like a different box art or was it the same box art as Wasteland, but with a couple of letters switched out? So it kept like the purple or pink font, right? Right. But like Tony Hawk is in like a different pose and like a different area, but it, it, it still has like Hollywood and Beverly Hills in the background. So it's like similar ish. It's so interesting that it's like a, it's a DS version of a game, but it's titled so differently. I mean, kind of. It's actually spelled with an, an eight instead of A-T-E. So it's S-K-8 land. Interesting. So yeah, I don't know. Pretty bizarre. It came out with Waste at the same time as Wasteland, but it's not Wasteland, but it looks like Wasteland from the box. Kind of, almost. Right, kind of, almost, yeah. So then we had Tony Hawk's Downhill Gem for the Nintendo DS, which honestly is pretty much the same as the home console version, but there's snowboarding in the game for some reason. So I don't know where that comes from. Honestly, I feel like with DS games in general, like 3D stuff was still really hard to do fluidly or I think that's the right word to use. Like, I mean, there are some games that did it well, like Super Mario 64 DS, and I'm sure there's a few other examples, but I just wonder like how the performance of Downhill Jam was on the DS versus the Wii version. Because the Wii version was still kind of fun, as weird as it was. Um, I just I just can't envision that, especially after seeing like the Skate It on the DS, where it just looks like a bunch of pixels moving at the same time, but it tries to do the 3D thing. Yeah, all these games look pretty pixelated, and I think the Skateland one where it's cell shaded actually looks the worst because of the cell shading. I, I, like, it just looks bizarre to me. Do they do something stylistic for Downhill Jam, or...? No, I think Downhill Jam kept, like, the, the regular graphics that the Tony Hawk games had, just in, like, a low-pixel version. <laughs> Great. Sounds lovely. But then after that, there was Tony Hawk's Proving Ground DS. But that honestly is just the same game as the home console version, just DS graphics again. But the last one was called Tony Hawk's Motion. And that one is interesting because it came with this little motion pack that you put into the Game Boy slot. And then like it, you could tilt the Nintendo DS and play that way. Like gyroscope controls before gyroscope? Right. And like you would, you would like turn and drive that way. And the game also had snowboarding, I think. What is the deal with the random snowboarding stuff? Yeah, I don't know what's up with that it's kind of wild to just be randomly thrown into the nintendo ds version i have no idea it's like we had sean white jump to skateboarding and then we have tony hawk constantly trying to do snowboarding stuff it doesn't really make that much sense bizarre okay so i know this is one you're probably really excited to get to talk about but tech deck back in the day was like the craziest thing Maybe not the craziest thing. Maybe I'm over-exaggerating a little bit. But I do remember, like, the little skateboards that you did with the little fingers were a big deal. They were kind of expensive, too, I felt like. I feel like they're, like, $8 for, like, a little skateboard and, like, the little wheels and stuff that you could switch out. Clever idea. They got a Game Boy game. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but I think you looked it up a little bit ago. Yeah, honestly, I, I don't know what this uh, game is supposed to be. You like some, like a like a naked potato sack on a skateboard. I, like, that's the best way I can describe it. That's the tech deck, dude. I don't know. I mean, uh, on a tech deck, sorry. Your naked potato sack on a tech deck. But like, I, I don't know. I mean, it looks fine for a Game Boy game, I guess. Uh, it's got a lot of locations, I think. Uh, you know, it, it kind of looks bland. Dude, do they still make tech decks today? I'm just thinking, like, that'd be something so much fun to get into like should we just start like buying tech decks in 2023 dude like a like a little tech deck collection do you think there's like uh mint condition tech decks that are like rated by some uh agency yeah like a psa what if they're like the next pokemon card resurgence just the tech deck resurgence dude it looks like they still do make tech decks and for some reason that makes me less interested in getting them i wonder if there's any like crazy crossovers nowadays like you know, did Tony Hawk ever get official tech decks, you know? I'm sure he did. Oh, sorry. One thing I forgot to mention about the tech deck Game Boy game, it was also published by Activision. Oh, so they're trying to, like, capitalize on the whole market out there. Yeah. Okay, and then we didn't have too much time to talk about all of, like, the little indie skateboard games that have released over the years. There's quite a bit of them, but one of them that I thought was kind of interesting that had a lot of potential and then just didn't really capitalize on the potential was the game Skate Bird. Did you ever play that? No, that sounds interesting though. I played it on Game Pass and was there for a while. And it's so close. Like 
so close to just like knowing what it wants to do. You play as a bird and you have a skateboard and there's like these levels you skate around in and it feels very reminiscent to the older arcade style Tony Hawk games and that was really cool except the problem with this style is like they just didn't really like see that idea through and I think like they maybe got distracted with trying to like make it over the top or whatever like I guess you can fly a little bit with your bird to make ollies and stuff better but just it just doesn't quite hit the nail on the head it doesn't have like the timer counting down that adds pressure to explore but then since you have more time to explore the areas that you explore aren't really that fleshed out either so it just feels like they didn't want to make it too challenging but then they didn't want to make it worth like exploring i guess if that's the right way to word it. it it was just close i really i really felt like they had something with the idea and a lot of people were looking forward to it and then it ended up just coming out and I thought it was pretty mediocre, but I had hope for it. So you're saying it was like a little, it was a little underwhelming, but also pretty good at the same time. It had a good idea. Right. It just was very underwhelming and it, it didn't live up to the good idea. I see, I see. Have you ever played any of the Tony Hawk iOS games? I looked at some gameplay when I was doing research for this video on that. Which one did you look at? The more recent one. It looks like it's like a side scroller thing. I think the side scroller was like the 2009 one, right? <laughs> okay, well then that's as recent as I looked, I guess. But yeah, I think the 2009 one was a side scroller. Then the 2014 one was like downhill jam, I think, where you like just go straight like down a map and you like dodge left to right, you know, pretty simple. And then I think the latest one, which is Skate Jam, which came out in 2018, I think is more like the original Tony Hawk games where like you free roam and you like you know, have a map and you just kind of do some tricks and stuff. But I think that one is also like, it's like a like a proper phone game, like with like bike transactions and daily quests and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Dude, it's the future. We, you know, I'm actually surprised we didn't get like Tony Hawk 1 and 2 released on iOS. I mean, we did get it on a Switch, but I'm surprised they didn't just go all out and put it on uh, mobile as well. Right. That's true. That's true. Because like... There was also a time where old games would just get a random iOS release, remember? Like the GTA games? Yeah, like the GTA games, for example. And that is, uh, you know, not that far off to release Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 through 4 on iOS as well back then. Right. There's another skateboarding game that's really big on iOS. I just can't remember what it's called. And I know we didn't talk too much about just like all the mobile games out there. It's called Skate City. It's on like the Apple game subscription that you can pay for and get access to. And like visually it looks pretty good. I haven't sat down and played this one, but if we were looking for like a mobile skating game, I feel like that would probably be the best go-to one. Unless there's like some secret gem that we don't know about. But I have, I've at least heard better things about this game. Apple's pushed it quite a bit to advertise their like gaming subscription service. So, I mean, it looks okay. It looks fun. I just don't know if, how great it actually plays. Yeah, I mean, usually Apple Arcade games are pretty decent. So, yeah. Like Oregon Trail. Like Oregon Trail, yeah. Okay, I think we kind of covered everything here. I feel pretty good about this video. I think we... We touched on all the skateboarding games over the years. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, we should go skating. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I think we should just <laughs> stick to the games. I don't know if uh, we should take up skateboarding as a hobby. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. Huge shout out to our patrons for supporting our channel, making these types of videos possible. If you enjoyed what you see, maybe you could subscribe. Let us know what your favorite skateboarding game was too. And we'll see you guys next time with a new video. Bye. Bye.